All right. So um, everyone can see my screen right now. Yep. Good. Usual disclaimer, guys. Obviously, do your own research. This is all just for informational purposes only. Yada yada. Um, <clears throat> so key events for the week ahead. We have a fair fair amount of uh, economic data points coming out this week. Durable good orders on Monday tomorrow. Core capital good orders Tuesday. Case Schiller. National Home Price Index, uh, Consumer Confidence, which I would imagine would be down on Tuesday. That could uh, hit the markets a little bit. Home ownership rate. Wednesday, we have Advanced Trade in Goods, Pending Home Sales Index, um, FOMC announcement. So with that, that with the Jerome Powell press conference at 2.30 p.m., expect that to cause a bit of uh, volatility in the markets. So just be aware of that event, especially if you're pl trading the, um, the zero day Wednesday contracts on SPY, which I know some of you do. Thursday, we have GDP data. Um, again, that probably won't look very good, but I don't think it matters as much. Um, they're already talking about new stimul stimulus in the markets or, uh, for the unemployment checks, $1,200. Um, Today they announced that, and that's obviously due to the Thursday and Friday red days we saw in the markets, right? So, you know, the continual pump in the markets is is pre prevailing, and um, you know, Trump and Mnuchin and Kudlow they want to they want to remain in power, obviously, and by putting checks into the hands of people that need them, um, they're trying to do that, right? Which is, I mean, it's right in, in a certain regard, but it's also wrong in a certain regard too, because you're devaluing the U.S. dollar, which we're going to discuss in a sec. Um, and then we have jobless claims on Friday, on Thursday as well. Um, and then Friday we have personal income, consumer spending, core inflation, employment cost index, Chicago PMI, and consumer sentiment index as well. So a lot of data this week. It's also the busiest week, um, for earnings season. So we have many of the heavy hitters reporting this week. We have Facebook, uh, Apple's reporting, Google's reporting, Visa, among others. We'll go over that too. Um, so the Swiss franc is actually really, really heating up against the U.S. dollar. And I was going to talk about this because um, the U.S. dollar is really collapsing right now. And I should have maybe put the slide after this slide. So no more king dollar. U.S. dollar is about to collapse. And you can see that over the last week or so, it's really, really started um, selling off very hard. And it's right at support right now. So if it can, continues to sell off, you could see it drop another three cents, roughly, possibly, um, possibly six cents or so, right? And then from there, it's anyone's guess it could drop down to eighty cents um, on the on the index, right? Or sorry, uh, eighty on the index. Um, and this could happen very abruptly, right? This is all a function of the U.S. the U.S. printing far more money than any other nation on earth in an attempt to quell the um, the economic effects of the coronavirus. But the problem is, is that what they're doing is they're just printing money and they're not taxing enough to actually create value in their, uh, in their dollar, right? So they're not pulling money from places that they need to pull from to pay the people. So what happens is they're just printing it. And as you know, if you have more dollars out there um, and the same number of goods, you're gonna have inflation, right? Uh, possibly even hyperinflation in the future. And not to worry uh, anyone who's from the US, I know a lot of you guys are, but um, it could be a big problem for people that are looking to buy certain goods. For the ultra wealthy, they're happy to, to experience inflation because they're holding hard assets, they're holding properties and, 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 um, and you know, um, rental properties as well, gold. Um, those assets will appreciate in value in a hyperinflation economy, right? People that don't have hard assets and have cash or no cash, they lose purchasing power and they can't buy as many goods, right? That's going to be a big issue um, for the U.S. primarily because the U.S. doesn't uh, produce as much as it used to produce and they import most of their goods. So that will be a, a big issue to look at going forward. Um, I'm not sure the U.S. government has thought through their actions, um, nor the Fed as well. And that could cause some serious economic repercussions going forward. Um, it may mean that and it likely will mean that the U.S. dollar is no longer the world reserve currency in the near future. Um, I'm not sure who will become the new uh, reserve currency, but if I had to guess, I would say likely the Swiss franc, which is why I posted this chart over here. 
And you can see that the Swiss franc against the USD, SHF.USD is the ticker you want to look at. Um, that is climbing sky high and it's about to break a, uh, a five year high over here. And I believe it's actually an all time high as well. So if you see that push above uh, around 108.7 or so, you can see it just start skyrocketing higher and higher and higher. Um, not advocating to buy Swiss francs because the utility for most people is not really there. If you want to pay your bills, you can't pay in Swiss francs. But if you do have a um, investment account, an investment account that enables you to buy uh, Swiss francs and you want to just hold it as, an, as a position, it's not a terrible idea because um, the Swiss aren't printing money like everyone else is, right? Um, the US is by far the largest inflationary risk um, currency wise globally because of how much they print it, right? They just keep printing money nonstop and they don't, they don't even think about what they're doing at all, right? Um, so yeah, it, it's something to look at, keep an eye on that. Uh, obviously, if you're in the US and you wanna protect your dollars, gold is gonna be a pretty important hedge for you in your portfolio. <clears throat> and look at that right now as well. So you can see that last week gold started breaking out. It's near an all-time high as well right now. Um, it's breaking out in a big way on heavy volume as well. And possible ways to play it are individual mining companies like Newmont Mining, NEM, for example, GLD, which is a gold ETF. And you can buy call options that expire, you know, a year or two years out as well on these assets. And those are not a bad way to play um, a rise in gold and also hedges against your currency. So if you have USD in your account and you're holding, you know, GLD, for example, or GLTD calls or NEM calls um, and USD starts crumbling, chances are gold is going to skyrocket. And with that, stocks like NEM and the ETF GLD will skyrocket. So even though you'd be losing on your USD, you'd be gaining value on those assets, right? So it's kind of an inflationary hedge. Um, and also a great way to do it as well is to buy the actual asset of gold. You can, you can buy gold coins, gold bricks. I know a few of you guys are actually doing that right now as well. Um, it's not a bad way to play um, the inflationary risk due to the demise of the US dollar, right? And a lot of people are thinking, thinking the same way already, right? They're looking at, the, at this and saying, okay, well, you know, we see the writing on the wall. Um, Peter Schiff is a great guy to listen to actually. He's been screaming for a long time to, uh, to you know, hoard gold and uh, he's been pretty bang on so far. Um, he's kind of a perma bear though, but either way, he's been pretty accurate in his assessment. And if you guys get a chance to listen to any of his podcasts, he's a, he's a very good person to listen to. He's very well informed and he runs the fun out of Puerto Rico. Uh, but you can see over here that call volume on GLD is at an all time or near, near an all time high, right? The last time it was this high was back in 2016. Um, and now you're seeing a huge spike in call buying on GLD, right? That's going to cause premiums to go up, make it more expensive to invest in call options on GLD. Uh, but buying leaps that are, you know, higher Delta, like a 0.5 Delta or greater, that might not be a bad way to play it, especially if gold goes to 5k announced in the next couple of years, that would cause GLD to skyrocket to, to around, um, probably around 500, uh, I would imagine. Um, given the correlation of GLD's assets to the actual uh, physical commodity of gold, right? So keep an eye on that. Silver is also a great investment too, and it's also a cheaper, a cheaper cost investment for those that don't have enough cash to go and buy a brick of gold, for example. Um, you can buy silver coins, uh, silver bullion if you want to, or you can buy corporations like WPM, Wheat and Precious Metals, which um, mines a lot of silver, or SLV, the silver ETF. Um, this futures contract doesn't have much history on it. So that's why the, the chart is, is only back till June, but you can see the breakout on silver right now. And, and it's, it's, it's heavy volume. Um, and silver will follow gold in a big way. So silver and gold are both great ways to play the uh, inflationary risk that presents itself due to a demise of the U S dollar. Right. In addition to the, um, the Swiss franc, right. Canadian dollar uh, may benefit as well because obviously Canada is a re resource-based economy. Um, a lot of it comes from oil, but uh, we, we do also have many, many mining stocks um, and, and companies from Canada as well, right? That mine a lot of gold and silver. So um, Canada would benefit as well from the rise in gold prices too. Um, 
I mean, I mean, the, the euro probably won't benefit too much at all. The yen won't benefit. And the uh, RMB or the yuan, the uh, Chinese currency, likely won't either. But one thing is, is pretty, pretty um, certain going forward, and that is that the U.S. dollar is going to crumble pretty fast. Again, because of how much money they're printing and devaluing their currency without thoughts to the repercussions of their actions, right? So Trump doesn't really think about that stuff at all. And um, it's funny because if you go back to like 2014, 2015, Trump was tweeting about how Obama was, was raising, was um, creating a fake economy and unemployment, the actual rate was actually around 20%, uh, back when it was 5%. And he was, he was bashing Obama for artificially inflating the stock market. And now we have the exact same situation occurring right now where Trump is actually, you know, lambasting Powell back when he was raising rates over the past um, year or so. Um, because he wanted the market to rise so that he could get reelected, right? Um, and that will cause a tremendous uh, disruption to the U.S. economy in the long run. And it, it will likely be the demise of the U.S. dollar as well. Um, and what will happen is that because the Fed's mandate is twofold, right? The Fed is in place for two reasons. One of them is to keep employment at the highest level possible. So, or, or the reverse of that is keep unemployment as low as possible. And the second reason is to keep inflation at around 1.9%. Now, if inflation takes off rapidly, um, sorry, one second, I'm just going to send someone else an invite as well. But um, if inflation takes off rapidly, then what will happen is, is the Fed will be forced to raise rates right away because they can't afford to let inflation get out of control, right? And what will happen when they raise rates is that it will cause all this all this debt that's out there right now, and there's record levels of debt everywhere, right? Um, a lot of it's uh, lower grade debt, but what'll happen is that th that'll ca cause the financing costs of those debts to skyrocket very quickly, and that will cause a cascading effect um, in certain industries causing companies to go bankrupt, right? And again, like this is my thesis over here. Uh, it's not for certain, this is what I think will happen. Um, take it with a grain of salt because you know I'm wrong as often as I'm right. Um, it's all about the asymmetry of risk on your trading, right? So you want to manage your risk. Take asymmetries of risk with probability, right? Um, if I think a certain thing is going to happen, I'm going to take a certain bet with a, por a portion of my account, um, usually between uh, one and two and a half percent of my account. Allocate that to a trade with asymmetry of risk, where I have you know three or four to one upside on a trade. Because if I lose. Typically, I'll lose about half a percent, uh, or sorry, half a position. So if I invest 1%, my maximum loss is half a percent. But if I invest 1% and my upside is, is four to one, I have upside of 4% in my account, right? So think of it from that perspective as well, that you know, we don't really know what's gonna happen. Anything can happen. Um, you know, if, you're, if, if Europe start, starts printing off a lot too, or Canada starts um, printing more as well, it could, it could kind, of, kind of stave off that delayed effect of the um of the dollar collapse but i do think the usd will collapse um pretty soon as well um so yeah here's the slb call volume it is actually at an all-time high and you can see how massive that spike is um recently right there this is all from um from um, sentiment traders uh twitter feed by the way if anyone wants to go there and check out the uh the links you post a lot of interesting stuff there uh, but you can see that Call buying is, is massive there right now, and it has been for the last little while. Um, next up, we're talking about earnings. So the week ahead is just ram-packed with uh, earning reports. So we have, we have Hasbro tomorrow morning, first thing, SAP. We have NXP, uh, semiconductors, aftermarket close tomorrow night. <clears throat> um, and then on Tuesday, we have Pfizer, McDonald's. 3M Innovation, Raytheon Technologies in the morning, uh, Altria, JetBlue, Harley Davidson, uh, Sherwin Williams. I think Sherwin Williams is, is going to be killing it because a lot of people are staying home right now and not traveling, and so they're performing home renovations. Uh, Sherwin Williams does um, uh, home paint, right? So they, they sell paint, and um, I think they might have a pretty solid report there. But I haven't looked at the option chain myself. Uh, just some commentary on that. After hours, we have AMD, Visa, eBay, Starbucks, FireEye. Uh, Akamai should be killing it as well. So Akamai uh, moderates or helps to, um, to smooth the flow of traffic on websites. And they actually manage um, many large sites like Apple's, for example. Um, so they'll probably be doing um, a lot better given that 
many people are using the internet more given that they're staying home and shopping online and stuff like that, right? So uh, I'd imagine Akamai, which ticker, ticker symbol is uh, AKAM, I think. Uh, let me pull that up on my chart right now, a sec. Um, yeah, you can see that they're trading not, not too far from a, uh, a high. If you go out 20 years, you can see that they were um, higher back in the dot-com era, but they're trading uh, at a 20 year high right now, pretty much, and they keep on breaking it higher and higher and higher. Um, yeah, actually the founder of the company, Dan Lewin, he was one of the first people to die on 9-11. He was a um, ex-Israeli special forces uh, guy that, that was on the airplane, um, the first airplane that crashed and he tried to take down one of the, one of the terrorists. So just an uh, interesting fact right there. Uh, he's, he was the CEO and founder of the company. And um, it's, it's ironic because um, their, their company actually helped to keep the traffic um, on CNN's site uh, alive during 9-11 when it spiked like crazy on that news event, right? So kind of uh, ironic, just a little fun tidbit right there for you guys. Um, back to the presentation though. <clears throat> so we have uh, AMD, which skyrocketed on Friday on Intel's terrible report. report. And Intel is kind of a, a foreboding of, of um, more, more bad news ahead in the tech sector. Um, they're delaying their chips by half a year roughly and probably not going to be making them themselves either. They're going to be outsourcing to a third-party contractor. So uh, AMD will benefit from that in a, in a dramatic way. And um, if you look at AMD's chart, I'll pull, pull that up right now as well and see how much it gapped up on Friday. So you see this massive gap up right here. Um, on the one-week chart, basically, if we pull up the one-year weekly chart, you can see the massive candle for the one week, right? It went from a close of 55 last week to a close of 69.40 this week, right? So a massive gain on the week. Um, if you draw a line here, you can see how much it gained. It gained about 24% on the week. And that was on massive volume too. It's probable it's gonna keep running, but um, I wouldn't be playing the upside into earnings given that it's run so much already. It probably needs to cool off a little bit, kind of like when you see these candles over here when it pops up um, you know, over here and over here, it has the downfall right after. So it's likely you're going to see a decline back down to like somewhere around a 57, 60 area or something like that. <clears throat> um, just trade cautiously on that name because it's already run so much. Uh, whoops. Uh, okay. And then we also have on Wednesday before open Shopify, Boeing, GE, Spotify, uh, Afria, Anthem, uh, Wingstop, GM, Six Flags, and Blue Apron. Uh, so obviously, Wingstop is likely doing less business because there's no sports going on right now. That might be an interesting play to look at uh, on the downside. Also, no one's eating restaurants either, right? So they're doing takeout, but takeout volumes aren't very high. And then you have uh, Six Flags, which obviously has been closed for a while now due to COVID. Um, you know, Boeing hasn't really done too well the last little while either. And given that airlines are seeing reduced volume, it's unlikely that they're going to see a massive push to uh, new revenues coming forward. So I'd expect their earnings to be pretty weak as well. Shopify should see a boost, obviously, because everyone's working from home. A lot of people are starting their own, their own websites and businesses online, selling, selling goods. Um, also, Shopify partnered with uh, Walmart recently too. So that should be reflected in their earning report. I think they're still way overvalued, but um, there'll probably be a positive report. After hours on Wednesday, we have Facebook, PayPal, Qualcomm, Teladoc, ServiceNow. Um, and ServiceNow is actually doing very well. I know that firsthand from my wife's um, business that she's in. Um, Corvo as well, semiconductors. So keep an eye on those as well. And then um, United Rentals. Um, PayPal is probably doing pretty well given that everyone's shopping online right now. No, no one's going to malls for the most part. Facebook, I would imagine, is going to have a pretty poor quarter because a lot of corporations pulled their advertising from Facebook uh, recently, as well as small businesses can't afford to pay for advertising when they don't have customers, right? So I'd imagine you're going to see a similar report to last quarter when they pulled guidance. Um, and I would, I would imagine there's going to be a pretty adverse effect on the tech sector um, as a whole because of that, right? PayPal, I think, would be pretty positive, but who knows how it'll respond. Uh, trade cautiously, check out the EMs and PMs, which we'll be going over in a sec, and uh, analyze those and use those as your, your um, sextants to, uh, to trade the, the underlying stocks, right? Um, Thursday, before open, we have UPS, MasterCard, uh, AstraZeneca, Procter & Gamble, Kraft Heinz, 
Abby, uh, Abdi Inbev, and uh, Eli Lilly as well, as well as Newmont Mining, which I mentioned earlier about uh, pretending to gold as well. So Newmont, I would imagine, is going to have a pretty solid report given that gold is rising, right? And they mine gold. Um, after hours, you're going to have Amazon, Apple, Ford, Alphabet, uh, Gilead Pharmaceuticals, and Jam Resorts, Mercado Libre, which is Brazil's version of Amazon, EA, Vertex, Pharmaceuticals, and Xilinx, which is another semiconductor um, company as well. So semis are reporting uh, a fair number. There's Corvo, Xilinx, and also NXP this week. Um, that should cause a movement in SMH, the uh, semi-ETF. So also AMD, obviously, too, right? Uh, but you're, you're seeing um, most of the big names from Fang, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, um, Apple and Amazon uh, reporting this week, as well as Google, right? So uh, we're going to see some significant movement in the markets this week, along with uh, Powell's testimony on Wednesday, right? Uh, Friday before open, we have ExxonMobil, AbbVie, Pinterest, Caterpillar, Merck, uh, Chevron, Under Armour, and... Um, Dominion Energy as well. So I would imagine Exxon and Chevron won't have great reports because oil has been beat up for the past few months. Um, but they are hunting for, for acquisitions. So they may, make, they may, they may um, give some commentary or color on that front as well. Keep an eye open for that. Um, otherwise, yeah, just um, analyze the EMs and PMs on whatever tickers you're trading. And remember that Thursdays are typically the best to sell iron condors on, especially for the after hours reports. So Amazon, Apple, Alphabet, Guild, MGM, um, MELI, Mercado Libre, EA. If you can find some, some nice iron condors on, a, on those tickers uh, that expire on Friday, given that it's, it's, a zero, it's, it's pretty much a zero day position, you, you get paid pretty much right away or you take a max loss right away, right? So <clears throat> there's, there's no waiting at all for your, for your payoff. Um, also Exxon or, um, or Caterpillar or Chevron would have decent moves as well. Um, SPY analysis for the week. So SPY closed at 320.45 on Friday. The uh, expected move is 668 or 2% in either direction. The potential move is 915 or 2.8% in other direction. Upper move is 329.60. Lower move is 311.30. So we're right near that, um, that gap fill at 332.50 area on the upper move of the week. I don't think we're going to get there given that we rejected off on um, Thursday last week and, and fell. Uh, it's probable we're going to head down to like 310 area. I think we're going to probably test that lower move this week. But uh, obviously, um, take, my, uh, you know, take a look at the option chain and analyze it for yourself and figure out if it makes sense for you to go short given your positions currently, right? And remember, remember, remember that right now you want to maintain relative portfolio neutrality because obviously if you're too bullish or too bearish and we get a massive movement in one direction, you're going to get either wrecked or make a lot of money, right? So you want to have positions balancing out where if you go up, you make some money. If you go down, you make some money as well. It doesn't matter too much, right? You don't want to have positions where you can't sleep at night and you're, you're, you're constantly checking your phone or your account because you're worried about after hours or pre-market action, right? That's, when, when, when you're doing that, you know that you're taking too much risk or you're not positioning yourself effectively for, any, for whatever could happen. Because keep in mind that any announcement on stimulus um, from, uh, from Trump or, or Mnuchin or Kudlow, for example, that can cause a sudden rapid reversal from, the, from a downside move to an upside move, even with bad earnings, right? Um, then we have NASDAQ, which hit uh, in near high on um, Tuesday last week, and then it fell down. So it hit almost 270 as well on the triple Q, <clears throat> and then it just bled all week. So most tickers in, uh, in the tech sector hit their upper, upper PMs last week on uh, Monday, Tuesday, and then they fell down and few of them actually hit their lower PMs and then bounce back up again. So if you played the, uh, the PMs last week on the, um, on the upside, you would have, would have made out like a bandit and also played the, the uh, downside as well. If you played both those sides, you would have won both, both ways. Um, so current price 255.17, EM 845 or 3.3%, PM 11.53 um, dollars or 4.5%. Upper move is 266.70, lower move is 243.64 for the week, right? So again, we should see a lot of movement uh, with Facebook, Apple, Amazon, and Google reporting. But don't discount Visa, uh, PayPal, MasterCard as well. Those can cause some serious movements too, right? Because if, they, if for example, MasterCard comes out and discusses a, um, a profit warning you know, for the year ahead or something like that, then that could uh, hit that sector as well, right? Even if 
reason as a positive positive uh, report then might pull them back as well right and then we have the um, small cap Russell 2000 ETF IWM current price 145.78 the EM for the week is 452 or 3.1 percent the PM is 6.13 uh, dollars <clears throat> or 4.2 percent upper move is 151.91 and the lower move is 139.65 so again you might see a rotation from the uh, mega caps like Apple, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Netflix, um, into the smaller caps again, which we've seen numerous times. Um, and last week, while Nasdaq was selling off, uh, IWM, uh, IWM, IWM, yeah, IWM is holding pretty steady, right? So keep that in mind as well. Um, for last week's analysis, we had a bunch of breaches on the upside, but they closed inside the range, right? So. Apple breached the upside and then closed inside the range. Uh, Amazon, um, Facebook, GLD, what is this? Uh, Shopify, SPCE, I'm sorry, no, Spotify, Spotify right there, uh, and Square, and also Zoom meeting as well. Those ones all, all popped up and then came right back down. The one, only ones that closed uh, outside the range for the week were AMD, um, GLD, uh, Nicola, and <clears throat> there's one more, and Win, Win as well. Yeah, so I actually wanted to point out Win too. Win is an interesting one to look at. I'm looking at going long there, just because if you analyze, where's one sec? Here's the chart on Win right now. If you pull up the one year uh, weekly candles, you can see that there's a lot of support right around 70 area. So we're only about three bucks away from that 70 region. Um, I might sell some puts there a month out or so, even though they have earnings, just to get assigned around 60 bucks if I can get some nice premium on those contracts. And if you, if you pull up the option chain there and see, uh, I'll, I'll pull it up right now to show you guys what I'd be thinking about. One second, here we go. So you can see for August expiration, 60 strikes are around $1.30 or so. And if you sell one of those, you're being assigned for 60 bucks minus a buck 30. So you'd be assigned at 5870, which I wouldn't mind owning when at because they have a nice dividend when they are, when they're operating in normal conditions. And even though it might take them a while to get back to normal conditions, given coronavirus, I do like them as a company. Um, that's one way to play it. Alternatively, you can play um, upside with call spreads too. It was at 85 bucks last week on Friday, right? So keep in mind, it's fallen a fair bit. Uh, LVS reported they had a pretty poor report as well. They fell. But um, you got to remember that bad news is pretty much priced in at this point on a lot of names. And you want to search, you know, bargain hunting on stocks that you don't mind owning longer term. Uh, remembering that coronavirus may stick around for, uh, for a year or more. And that will you know, weigh on a number of companies that will have their businesses change for a while, right? So uh, going back to the presentation as well. Um, for the week ahead, we have... A lot of reports and a lot of tickers to analyze. Thank you very much to Frank as well. He does this great work on Fridays and puts a lot of time and effort into this. So if you guys can thank him as well, that'd be appreciated. Thank you very much, Frankie. Um, so we have Apple reporting on Thursday after hours. They're opening at 370.48 uh, or close at 370.48 on uh, Friday. The EM is $18 in one direction, so 4.8%. And the PM is 24.6, right? So you have a massive, massive range of values on Apple. Uh, 345 downside is 395 upside, right? Keep in mind that they've been uh, operating with their stores closed pretty much for the last quarter. And last quarter, they, they didn't give a gu uh, guidance either, right? So it's going to be interesting to see what kind of color they, they give on earnings. And that could really hit the market given that they're the largest corporation in the world right now, right? Um, you, saw, you saw last week Microsoft report, they had a nice beat and they still fell. Right, so keep that in mind too. Um, I would be betting probably downside on Apple or selling out of the money call spreads, um, you know, a month out, and pulling in that nice premium on a demise in their stock over the short term. AMD reports on, I believe, Tuesday after hours. Their PM is fourteen percent in one direction, about ten dollars in one direction. So you have upper move of seventy nine, almost eighty, and a lower move of fifty nine, fifty eight, which would be the gap fill from Friday, from Thursday. Sorry. So um, they're going to have a pretty serious move. Um, they had a lot, a lot of buying on Friday, and it was, it was um, heavy, heavy buying. 
So it's possible to push it up again, but I wouldn't be betting on the upside after that dramatic move last week. Amazon, the PM is 10% in one direction. So you have a huge range of values between a high side of 3,313 to a low side of 2,704, right? That's a big $600 range on uh, Amazon stock. Um, they may have done very well out last quarter, given that coronavirus has, has uh, closed down their competitors for the last roughly half a year. Um, but at the same time, they're incurring increased costs as well, right? So remember that. Um, AZN reports too. I believe it's on Thursday pre-market, if I'm not mistaken. Their PM is 6.8% or about a $4 move. So their upper move is 60, uh, sorry, uh, about 60 and their lower move is around 52. That one I won't be trading myself, but uh, keep an eye on that if you're interested in trading um, AstraZeneca. Boeing reports this week too. Their, uh, their range of values is 10% wide. PM is 17 in one direction, upper move 191.19, lower move 156.39. Caterpillar <coughs> um, closed at 137.59 on Friday. Their range of values is uh, 863 wide, so upside 146.22, downside 128.96. And then GLD, as I mentioned before, uh, it keeps running, obviously, it's gonna, it's gonna go higher and higher and higher, right? That, was, that to me would be a longer term trade because obviously it's run a lot in the last few weeks. It might cool off for a week or two uh, and then run again. So I would wait for that, uh, that call buying to subside a bit, let the, um, the skew to the upside die down just a little bit before I go long on that. Um, otherwise, if you own physical gold or if you're buying you know, gold coins, for example, or NEM, uh, which reports on Thursday morning as well, then those could be your alternative plays to GLD, right? But I do think that gold will run to around 5K an ounce in the next couple of years. And that will coincide with a demise in the US dollar. Um, we have Google reporting as well on Thursday after hours, their move is expected to be 7%, sorry, that the PM is 7% or 106 in one direction. They may have benefited from Facebook's, um, uh, advertisers pulling away from that platform. So that might be a tailwind to Google going forward. Right. Also keep in mind that everyone's using, um, Google all the time and they're working from home now too. So. There may be more use of uh, Google, um, what's called Google, Google Teams or Google Hangouts, or whatever it's called, um, for team environments for, uh, for working, but um, that doesn't generate revenue for them. So uh, let's see what happens with Google on, on Thursday. So Thursday will be the big move. Like Friday in the markets, you can expect to see a lot of volatility given that you have Apple, Amazon, and Google all reporting on Thursday evening, right? That's a lot of um, market cap reporting. You have, I think, a combined market cap there of, of about uh, four trillion dollars, which is which is massive, right? <clears throat> um, then you have IWM for the week. The um, the PM is six thirteen, so upside is one fifty two and downside is one forty. We already discussed that. Mastercard um, PM is five percent roughly, or a move of fifteen dollars in one direction. You can play sympathetically with um, Mastercard or Visa by playing Amex or Discover or Capital One, for example, and a great a great example of sympathy plays was last week when Intel reported and AMD skyrocketed on Intel's terrible report, right? So if you analyze those tickers and see that the IV is super low because they're not reporting and you, you have a certain thesis, for example, uh, I know that Luigi from our, our chat, he, um, he purchased the $61 call options for I think 23 cents on Thursday night before close. And they ended up being worth $9 almost on Friday, right? That's a massive, massive movement for, uh, for small risk. As, mu as much of, the, of a gamble as it was, it paid off handsomely for him, right? So look for the um, sympathy plays when you're looking at, uh, at uh, trading a certain ticker, right? You don't need to look at the exact ticker that you're looking at. Like when you're looking at, you know, for example, Facebook, you can look at Google, but obviously this week they're both reporting, so the IV will be behind both of them at the same time. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So you have uh, McDonald's reporting as well. They're... Uh, their move is 4.1% uh, PM. So 818 one direction, upside 207, downside 190. And their sales were down last quarter due to coronavirus. I expect them to be down again, even though they're doing more drive through volume and more Uber Eats. Keep in mind that a lot of people like to eat in, in the restaurant and not having that volume of customers in the restaurant is, is going to hurt them, right? You can serve a lot of people in drive through obviously, but you can't serve as many people in drive through and uh, when, uh, when you're not serving people in restaurant as well, right? Cutting off some, some of your order flow. Then we have... Um, 3M, uh, which I'm not really looking at too much. Uh, Matt, um, Microsoft reported last week, their PM is 4.2%. Expect them to move a lot, given that you have Amazon, Apple, 
uh, Alphabet and Facebook reporting this week too. Netflix, uh, PM is 5%, upside 505, downside 455, so pretty wide range of values there too. Um, Nikola, they dropped a lot last week. They're at around 30 bucks a share now, and I expect them to keep dropping given that I think they're way overvalued, but that's my opinion. Um, upside 3588, downside 2396. NVIDIA could be a sympathy play, like I mentioned on AMD, for example, right? If they have a phenomenal report, you might see NVIDIA jump as well. And given that they've already reported, they may jump um, in step with AMD, right? So their PM for the week is 6%. Uh, 25 one direction upside 432.92 downside 382.88. Then we have Pfizer reporting this week as well. Their their PM is 6.2 percent uh, upside 40 downside 35. Not a huge range of values. You might be able to find a decent iron condor there possibly. <coughs> um, PayPal they report as well on Wednesday I believe after close uh, or it might be Thursday actually. Uh, check this second actually let me see. Where is it? Wednesday yeah after close. So PayPal reports on Wednesday after close. Their PM is 9.4%, um, upside 188.87 and 156.25 uh, downside. I know they've been killing it because, uh, I mean, I use them a lot for everything I do online from receiving payments to paying other people as well. Um, and I know that the volumes have gone up a lot of late. Qualcomm, um, they should move in sympathy with other companies as well uh, in, the, in the semi-industry. They have a... PM of 7%. I think they actually report this week too, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Qualcomm, maybe over here. You gotta check on, to, to see if they're reporting this week, but I imagine they are given that that's a pretty large um, PM for the week for them. Either way, 95 upside, 82 downside, right? Triple Q, we already reviewed. Roku, 9% move in one direction, so 1374. Uh, Upside 164.87, which would be near, near their all-time high, and downside 137.39. Shopify reports this week, they have a PM of 13.5%. Upside 1056.49, downside 80409. Um, space, one of my personal favorites right now, given that they're in a very opaque business and they're at a low market cap valuation with high short interest. Um, they have a PM of 17% and they're also unveiling their, their cabins this week too. So that should be interesting to look at. That's a pretty massive uh, range of values for, for the week. So 28, 44 upside, 2018 downside. Spotify as well, they have a 12.9% uh, PM, upside 303.28, downside 233.98. Um, Spy we already reviewed. Tesla, I'm sure some of you are holding that or looking at it as well. They reported last week, they had a decent report. Um, but they're way overvalued. I think they're going to keep on dropping down given that, um, you know, all the bulls thesis of uh, S&P inclusion may not come to fruition even with their profitable quarter. And I say profitable in quotation marks because they deferred a lot of bonuses to try and get that that uh, the positive EPS out. Uh, so some, ni some nice financial engineering on the part of Musk and Co. But um, I don't think they're going to be doing so hot in the next little while. But it doesn't mean I'm going to short them because obviously the premiums are insanely high. If I do find some asymmetry of risk, though, where I can risk, you know, five bucks to make 95 on a given week, I will do that. And uh, I'm happily, happy to do that because, obviously, asymmetry of risk is insane, right? Visa reports this week, too. Their, their uh, PM is more moderate at 4.7%. Upside 204.31. Uh, downside 185.99. They're a possible sleeper right there because, keep in mind, everyone is shopping on, on using Visa as well, right? So um, they may have an upside surprise and pop to all-time highs around 2.15-ish, um, right? XOM reports Friday, uh, PM 6% roughly, upside 45.98, downside 40.66. And last but not least, ZM, 7% um, move for the week, uh, 263 upside, 230 downside. And now we have time for Q&A, guys. Fire away. I missed... Um the first 20 minutes. What'd you say about Monday and Tuesday earnings? If you don't mind highlights, oh, man. I, I actually recorded this time, so I'll, I'll send it to you. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem, Paul. Yeah, guys. Um, any questions at all about earnings plays, plays that you're looking at? I know Aaron was looking at a certain play on, uh, on Apple as well. Yeah, I got a couple, I think, good plays on, on Apple. I was uh, evaluating. 
Um, I can share my screen if you want to look at them. Uh, one second. The only thing is, I think it'll, it'll, it'll stop me from uh, recording after I share my screen with you, or let, let you share your screen. Okay. Uh, one second. Let me just see if I can do that one sec. Um, stop share and give you permission to share one sec. Uh, there you are. Uh, make host. All right, there you go, man. You got it. All right, share screen. Give someone a name. Let's see. All right, so let's see. Well, I was looking at actually a couple of them, but let's start with the APL. APL. So I was kind of running through on Apple and I'm kind of bearish for their earnings. Mm -hmm. And so I was running through looking at iron condors and I was like, well, let's see if I can add an extra wing to the upside on it. So what I did is as you can see here the iron condor I built and then I decided to add a vertical wing to the top end of it. So basically on the call side of the wing, I did the same but with puts so when you do that it actually changes your risk profile quite a bit so like if I did a straight vertical on it you know your your risk is 103 top side 147 you add the iron condor to it it shifts your your risk to your reward on the upside so it's kind of cool. I mean, I might, I'm going to revisit this and probably adjust my, my PT on it, but it was just an idea. Okay. The other one I was looking at for a little higher PT, give me a, a little more probability was the vertical on the 3D75, 385. And as you can see per contract, you know, you're risking 195 to make 55. Mm hmm you have the iron condor to it and it shifts your risk to your reward. So now you're only risking 145 to make 105. Yeah, that's not too bad at all for an IC, yeah? Yeah, it's not at all. And then the other one I was liking was NVIDIA for this week. And it looks like kind of strong support for me. So like I was looking at NVIDIA, like at 391 support roughly. Mm -hmm. so i was looking at taking some verticals on a bullish thesis above 391 obviously you want to give yourself a little extra room outside of that so i was looking at the you know the little more of a middle ground there with either the 3d5 387 and then you can get a little more premium i believe out of selling on the put side. So you're risking, well, these are 10 contracts. So if you're, you're selling credit spreads on this, the vertical, risking 194 to make 56, which is a really high probability trade. But yeah. I know you like doing the more, the higher reward to risk. It just kind of depends on what your preference is. Yeah, well, if, if it dived early in the, um, early in the week, right, and you managed to get higher credit on the put side due to a dip, that wouldn't be a bad idea, right? Yep. Yep. So I'm just kind of holding on to those to look for the week to see if it, it does come down towards that, that 391 range. Mm -hmm. So I would like that. I'd like to take those, those verticals if it does come down towards that. Not, not bad ideas at all. Yeah, I like the, uh, especially if they move to the to the lower PM or the upper PMs, right? And then you manage to get those high uh, asymmetry of risk trades. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, I appreciate you sharing, man. Well, thank you, Nick. I'll give it back to you. Sure. You know how to give it back uh, control? I guess you, I, awesome. Um, one second. What do you think about Square Sympathy for PayPal earnings? Oh, I, I can't share a screen right now. Um, I think uh, Aaron, you might need to go to, to your uh, Zoom and, and, and uh, remove your share screen, I think. Not that it matters, I guess. It doesn't really matter too much, but I can't share it. 
any option chains at all right now. Um, you said you said Square's earnings. No, I was saying uh, do you, don't. Do you think I was thinking that Square would probably uh, be affected heavily by Visa and PayPal and uh, yeah, and Mastercard, not mainly PayPal. Um, but they're not really direct competitors. That's why I was asking. What no, they're opinion? not. Yeah, no, no, they're not. I mean, like I have my option up right now. Um, yeah, Aaron, if you if you could go to your Zoom and I think you can um, like uh, rescind. Um, ability to share a screen and that would I think give me the ability to share my screen because I can't share my screen right now for whatever reason or yeah I, I can just screenshot and post it on discord too if you guys want to see it in discord and just it's less efficient obviously because I can't share the live screen or the live charts um that's left oh he left yeah I think so oh maybe that's why he must have left before he gave me permission to uh to reshare okay I don't know I, I'm gonna do this then I guess um that sucks. I can't actually, no, 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 it's fine. Now. Yeah, I got it. Okay. All right. Sweet. So you said square. So it says it's recording still too. So I think we're all good. Yeah, It is recording still. Yeah. Yeah. So square, um, for the week, one twenty. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, I've been wanting to get in it since it was like 85 and I just feel like I missed it, but now I feel like I'm chasing. So I've been looking you for are chasing for sure, man. Yeah. I, I went yeah. chase. like their valuation is absurd right now and they will have a pullback. They make no mistake. They will have a pullback. Right. So don't, don't chase out of FOMO because you will get a, a buying opportunity pretty soon. Right. Just be patient with it. Um, there's no point to rush. I was thinking even when I did, I'd probably sell a put just to make sure I get a good deal. Yeah, you could. I mean, if if you want to be a like if you want to be assigned well well in advance, you could. Um, but like, if you pull up the option chain and look at one second, I have too much stuff up on my screen. Let me just minimize a few things. Square. Okay. So if, for example, you went out to like August expiration, you could sell like a hundred strike put for a buck sixty five. I mean, you're even at a hundred dollars, though, it's still kind of. It's, it's still expensive, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Right. But for example, if, you're, if your plan was to get acquire like 200 shares, you sell one put there, it gets assigned to you at 90 and change. And then on the IV pop, on the drop uh, down below 100, you sell like an 80 strike put, you know, a few months out. And then your average price is like whatever, you know, like 90 bucks or something like that, right? It's, yeah. still, it's still yeah. expensive though, right? Because if you basically drop back down, down to like 60 bucks a share, even that last quarter, they didn't provide any guidance whatsoever. And they said that, that their um, next six months would be pretty, pretty damn hard for them, right? So they rallied really, really for no reason whatsoever. It's been in the face of like a terrible news um, for the company. Right? It's YouTube videos, man. I just need to be patient. I just need to be patient. Yeah, be patient for sure. Be patient. Yeah. Um, any more questions, guys? <clears throat> Anyone else? Hey, Nick. Tom here. Question for you on uh, AMD this week with it running so hard. What's your thoughts on playing on selling credit spreads? Um, near the money or in the money? Do you have a preference over the two, or do you just prefer iron condors in general? Um, iron condors are a better place if you're going outside of the potential moves. Um, but if you're going to do a in the money credit spread, for example, look at doing a um, a call spread in the money for Friday, right? Let's say you do sixty five seventy. <clears throat> right now you're pulling in a credit of let's see, around two seventy ish. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, for risk risk of five minus two seventy, which is two thirty, uh, it's the same asymmetry. If you were to buy a put spread, right? If you were to buy the the seventy sixty five put spread, you're gonna have almost the exact same uh, debit, roughly, right? You're you're, you're debiting two thirty here to make two seventy instead of risking uh, two thirty on the in the money short call spread, right? It's, it's the exact same uh, reflection. The only difference is that because you're selling an in the money contract on the call side, you can be assigned early, right? That can kibosh your trade because can force you to either or your brokerage will automatically assign your contract to offset it or can force you to be to uh, be in a margin deficit right away right that would be a problem for you um, so I typically prefer to go with the debit side obviously because if you're gonna trade the exact same asymmetry of risk why not take the debit side and have no risk of assignment you know yeah, that makes sense yeah but if you want to go like you know outside the range <clears throat> you might say okay well I'm gonna go outside the um, expected range for the week you need to go probably pretty high out the out of the range but even if you did like a 82 for example um like 83 
call spread, you're not pulling in a lot of credit overall. Like you're pulling in like maybe 12 cents credit for 88, 88 cents risk, but your probability of profit is like 90%. So you have a very high probability of profit on the trade. If you go both directions and you do a symmetrical bet on the iron condor, so you go down to like around, uh, let's say you go to 58, you sell the premium here. Now, see, due to the skew right now, the premium isn't equivalent on the put side. So if I pull up the skew on, on the chart on, on AMD, you can see, yeah, the skew is favoring heavily the call side right now. So well, I know we were talking in one of our chats about selling just at the money, um, $1 call spread. So like, let's say it stays at 70 all week, you know, we. We, we sell the 70 and then buy the 71 and we just do as many of those contracts. You're basically risking 50 bucks to make 50 bucks or double your money um, with the anticipation that, you know, all tech is going to sell off in, in general this week since the high valuations, but you know, yeah. anything could happen. Anything could happen. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I would probably wait because they report on Tuesday after hours. So you're going to probably get a, um, a call buying frenzy into Tuesday close. If it pushes up into into the uh, upper range by Tuesday close, which it may because it had strong volume and, and strong momentum on on Friday, you may see it push up to like seventy five ish before earnings. At which point the premiums on the call side would be that much more juicy, and then you could sell them uh, out of the money if you wanted to. But obviously you need to be okay with the risk, right? Like you need to be okay taking that risk if you do lose, right? So you would sell the call call spread out of the money and say, okay, you know what, I'm okay losing if if uh, if it hits, right? Um, and you you may risk, for example, like. 80 cents to make uh, 20 cents on a, on a way out of the money iron condor one wide, or you can go with a higher probability trade and, and risk a bit more and say, okay, you know what? I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to go like maybe five wide pull in more credit. So I'm, I'm going to sell, for example, um, like the 85 and I'm going to buy the 90 or something like that. Right. But again, your asymmetry risk there is so terrible. Like you're risking like 470 or, or 475 to make 25 cents, right? The risk reward is terrible there, right? The probability of profit is, is massive. Like your probability of making a profit is so high. It's, it's like about 94%, which is great. Um, if you combine that with a put side spread as well and you go out of the money there too, like maybe you do you know, a, um, a 60, 55 or something like that, then it gets to be a bit more reasonable where your reward is like, you know, it's like, like 70 cents reward to make uh, with a uh, 430 risk, right? Again, the asymmetry risk isn't, isn't great there, but your probability of profit is still about 92% there, right? <clears throat> so it's not too bad if, if you're okay with the risk, right? You, you can also play with it and narrow it. Like you can just, just bump up the, um, each, each, each position and uh, lower it and you can see how it changes your profile of risk. So now you have, you know, risk of four bucks minus 60 cents of credit. So you're, you're risking three, 340 to make 60 cents, right? If you keep bumping it up to like 57, for example, and down to like 88 over here, then now you're risking um, $3 to make um, 50 cents. So your risk is 250 to make 50 cents. So this might be more favorable to you because the asymmetry risk here is, is roughly um, one to five, which is more favorable than risking like, you know, uh, $4 and 40 cents to make like 70 cents, at which point your risk reward is roughly like, like 5.4 uh, to one, which is not, uh, sorry, one, one to 5.4, which is not very good. <clears throat> Right. Do you see any benefit to selling or to doing debit spreads or uh, credit spreads on that over doing, say, like uh, a credit spread strangle, uh, maybe like a little bit out of the money on each side, to, like halfway on the implied movement? Um, I mean, if, if you go for a, a credit spread strangle, like your, your downside is unlimited, right? That's the only issue. Um, if you have the margin to do it, like, I guess it's not terrible, but even so, like you're pulling in, if you're going, if you want to go like really safe, you want to go to around 85 or above. And again, like, you know, you're pulling in 55 cents over here at the 85 strike. If you just, if you just do a spread, you're reducing your, your debit or your, your credit by like by half, but you're also hedging your risk by 50 cents. Right? Like, I mean, I know it's, it's low probability that uh, a low probability event that it runs like, you know, a hundred bucks by Friday, but let's say you sell this naked and it goes to hundred bucks, you, you lose, you lose 1450 on your position, right? Even if you, you know, sold the, uh, the put side as well. So I'm not a fan of selling naked positions just because the asymmetry of risk is so poor that, that all it takes is one bad trade. Even if, and, and again, like I prefer to risk between one. I think and, I, think and I asked that question wrong. I meant to say, um, doing a credit spread strangle, so or a, a debit spread strangle, 
Yeah. So, so you're paying for the spread on each oh, side. I see. Um, saying, you know, you're risking a dollar on each side to make four dollars on each side. So, you know, in theory, if it moves half of the implied movement, you're doubling your money. Would well, be the yeah. idea. So in that case, you could just do a, just do a reverse iron condor, right? You could just you know buy the fifty five, sell the sell the ninety, and then buy the I don't know like sixty and sell the fifty five, right? In that case, you're 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 spending like seventy cents, and your and your upside would be four thirty, right? That would be the way you'd want to do it, probably. Or you can or you, if you want to go wider, you can go wider too. You can go like ten wide if you want to. You can go down to like fifty and go up to uh, ninety five if you wanted to. Or actually, I get, oh, the highest thing goes 92. So in that case, you go to 40, uh, 53 over here, right? So you're, you're seven wide on each side. So you're risking uh, 83 cents to make seven minus 83. So you're risking 83 cents to make $6 and 17 cents. Uh, sorry, $6 and uh, yeah, 17 cents. That's right. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, guys. Uh, any more questions at all? We have time for maybe one or two more. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Anyone? No? All right, guys. Well, I appreciate your time as always. Hopefully you guys found this useful and I'll be posting the presentation on the server. Uh, if you have any questions after, after um, the fact that you may have forgot about a uh, friend asked me, just uh, hit me up and I'll respond when I can. Uh, hey. I got one. I got one quick question. Everybody probably would benefit from what. What I was asking you about this. What do you feel about as opposed to uh, is uh, investing in just like GLD as opposed to actual to miners? Well, GLD you're investing in in gold spot itself, price. Right? Spot price, yeah. right? So, so um, you're not really um, caring too much about the the uh, individual performance of a company. So if you go out like two years, for example, and you're, you know, say you're bullish on gold like I am, it needs to go to you know, 5K an ounce. Let's say you buy one of these 200 strike calls for like, you know, 11 bucks and it does kind of fruition where it's, you know, 5K an ounce in, in two years, right? Well, in that case, these would be worth prob around um, $300 each, right? So you'd you, you pretty much put a, put a thousand bucks and change in and they'd be worth $3,000 in like two years, assuming that thesis played out, right? Or if you want to go, you know, way out of the money, you can go out of the money as well. Uh, you can use, I wouldn't do spreads because if you're doing spreads and it goes in your favor, you know, way early, you're going to have to wait like two years to get your max profit, right? So there's no point in doing spreads. You can do some calendars if you wanted to, for example. You can do some, some straight calendars. Like yeah, I was thinking about buying a leap and then just selling out of the money calls against it every week. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Like, you know, for example, you could buy the 200 for January 20, uh, 21st, 2022. And then you can go to like this January coming up and you could sell, for example, the 200 over here, right? So you're, you're, so you're buying and selling the same strike, um, albeit you have a lot of time on this contract over here. So you might go a little bit shorter in duration. You might go to like, let's say October, for example, before, before the election. And uh, in that case, you're reducing your debit amount by about two dollars overall um and you have what is it so for october duration you have uh 82 days which isn't that bad right that means that if it runs 200 like on the nose by october expiration before the election basically you cash you, you, you cash in max profit on your short contracts and you're way in the money on your long contracts which means that your your january contracts would be worth um for the 2022 expiration be worth let me see it'd be worth um uh, you think it would be better to try and sell a few months at a time like that as opposed to trying to do it weekly or a month? Yeah, monthly? yeah, I, I do. Yeah, yeah, because you're gonna get more premium. It's less management on the position, and really, you want to know you want to define your risk. If you get a fast run, like ask Joel about it, right? Joel was doing the same thing. Same with Skylar too. They're both trading GLD um, calendars, and they're also doing some some um, calendar verticals too. And uh, I think Skylar got got uh, caught on one of his weekly contracts, had to roll it down. Um, he ended up making a profit on the, on the trade, but it was. It was too close, and, and if you have a fast run, like if you have, if you have a collapse in the USD over like a five day period, and gold runs up like two hundred bucks over over like a week, which it could have, you're gonna miss it. You're gonna miss most of it. Exactly, exactly, right? Yeah, that's just it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Yep. Yeah, hopefully that helps you guys. All right, thanks, man. Yeah, no problem. Uh, whoever wants a copy of the, of the video, just let, let me know, um, and I will see you guys tomorrow in voice chat, bright and early. Have a great evening, and talk soon. Later, guys. No problem, guys. Take care.